الله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله وصلى الله على سيدنا حبيبنا مولانا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين Respect your brothers and sisters in the name by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he is most worthy and deserving of all praise. We ask Allah and we ask Allah alone to guide us, to prevent us from being misguided and from misguiding others. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our shortcomings, our weaknesses, our sins, those that we commit knowingly and those that we commit unknowingly. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the noble Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam to bless his noble companions, his family, and the righteous everywhere. Ameen. Respected brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in the 17th chapter in Surah Al-Isra, he says, Qul, say, on the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لو كان في الأرض ملائكة يمشون مطمئنين لنزلنا عليهم من السماء ملك رسولا. الله سبحانه وتعالى says that had the earth been populated by angels, then assuredly and most certainly Allah سبحانه وتعالى would have sent an angel as a messenger. And I want to dive a little further into this verse. Because it, like all verses in the Quran, deserves further exploration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the construction in the Arabic language is such that the verse begins by saying, Lo kana. And in the Arabic language, when we say, Lo kana, it's like presenting a hypothetical. It's like saying what, how we would say hypothetically, or imagine if you will. And so, while the possibilities or the probability of such an occurrence happening is not high, nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to reflect on something. Oftentimes, and more often than not for us, to glean an example and a lesson there. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that had the earth been populated by angels, that is to say in exclusion, so only angels, living in tranquility and peace as angelic beings would live on the earth in harmony and tranquility. And that if the angel, if the earth was populated exclusively with these angels, living in peace and harmony, then most certainly, assuredly, again, there's, uh, there's a stressing in the Arabic language here, that indeed, that Allah would have sent an angel as a messenger. And the verse is as important for what it says and equally what it is not explicitly saying, saying. And by that I mean that the verse is addressing us, is speaking to us, it is on the tongue of the Prophet, in fact, could say, O oh, Muhammad. And so, the messenger of Allah, the messenger of God, who himself, Ana I am a human being like you, as the Prophet says. And he is speaking to a human, largely human audience. And so what the verse is imagining or allowing us to explore is this relationship that exists between prophets, messengers of God, guides, reformers, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses, and the community or the people or the population that they are there to reform, to guide, to be a messenger for. And so the direct relationship here and allowing us to reflect upon is the fact that the message the, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen human messengers for human communities, for human beings, because that is who we are. We are human beings. And so what I wish to talk about today, brothers and sisters, is this idea of being human. And that in fact, being human itself is the greatest challenge. Because I would submit to you that the challenges and the frustrations and the, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the struggles that we see in the world today are the result of human beings losing their humanity. Forgetting 
their humanness and their humanity. Or in other words, forgetting their fitra. And we'll talk about this in a second. And on the tongue of, or in the words of the in the words of the poet from the subcontinent, uh, Ghalib, he says, Baske Dishwar Kaharkan ka asahona, admikubi mayasadnihi insan. That it is outside of the realm of possibility that all things in life will come easy to you. It's not possible that life is going to just be a cakewalk. It's going to be easy. In fact, it is difficult for a person to be a human being. And what he's talking about again is this idea of what it means to be truly human. Not just be human because of our composition of our makeup. We are flesh, and we are blood, and we are bone. Yes, we are human. But to be truly human, and to truly encompass what it means to be human. And that, as I said, brothers and sisters, I would submit to you, is the greatest challenge for us today, is to, is to recognize, first and foremost, our humanity. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, that every child, every human being is born in a state of fitra, in a state of primordial purification, of purity, of perfection, of this fitra that is pure, that is wholesome, that is not corrupted. And then the Prophet continued and he said that then it is the child's parents that make that child a Jew, a Christian, or a Zoroastrian, and so on and so forth. And what the Prophet ﷺ remarkably is allowing us to examine is that age-old question of nurture versus nature. Of nurture versus nature. That is this, this, this struggle that often exists between what we are created in, the state of, of how we are created, which is our fitra, and then those environmental factors and those factors of nurturing that can preserve the integrity of that fitra, or it can corrupt that fitra. It can allow human beings to lose their humanity, to lose sight of their fitra. And in the language of the Quran, in the discourse of the Quran, the opposition the opposition forces, if you will, those things, those environmental factors, those nurtural factors that can corrupt the human spirit, that can corrupt that state of purity that we are born in, are known as fitan or fitna. It is the trials and tribulations of life, the trials and tribulations of the hayat dunya of the worldly existence, that can and do corrupt the human spirit and corrupt that fitra, that primordial nature, that pure nature that we are born in by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we are born with according to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and by the will and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Notwithstanding the fact that this presents a opportunity for us to engage in a conversation, just as a side note, with those who profess to be of the Christian faith. Because we reject the notion of original sin, which is a foundational tenet in Christianity. That human beings are born into a state of sin. They are born in need of redemption. And then that redemption and that salvation comes from outside of human history, which is what the crucifixion of Christ represents, which is what Christians been celebrated a week ago, today, Good Friday, and Easter. Right? Is it, this, is a, this is a pivotal moment in Christianity and in Christendom with regards to what it means for what, 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 what the reality and what it means with regards to the crucifixion of Christ. But this, that, that's just as an aside. So it opens up the possibility of that conversation that no, Islam doesn't recognize that nature of sin. Yes, human beings are capable of sin, surely, but we are not born in a state of sin. We are not born in need of redemption and in salvation, in need of redemption. Rather, we are born pure. And so the challenge before us, brothers and sisters, in recognizing our humanity, 
is to recognize that what is called for us, what we are asked to do, is in fact preserve and keep intact the wherewithal, the, the, the natural human resources that we are born with. Because we are born in a state of fitrah, of primordial perfection, of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us as pure, as innocent, as free from blemish. And so, first and foremost, recognizing that what we are being tasked with, both individually and collectively as a community, and as a society, is to keep intact, to preserve, and to protect the fitrah, and to prevent the fitna, to prevent those things that can corrupt the human spirit, that can corrupt and blemish that fitra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with. But a part of understanding that, a part of understanding the struggle that lies before us, the challenge that we have, which is to preserve that human nature, is to first and foremost understand human nature, is to understand our humanity. And to go back to the verse that I started with, in establishing a, 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 a contradistinction, a distinguishing feature, what is different from us than the angelic beings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And what, is, what, is, what separates us beyond our composition, they are creatures of light, of pure light, and we are creatures of minatim, of clay. And that itself has some importance that we'll hopefully have a, talk, uh, have a chance to, to explore. But the fact of the matter remains that we as human beings are valuable. We are not perfect. We are imperfect beings. We have the capacity to sin. We in fact will sin. In one of the reflections, one of the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, he tells us that that if the earth was created, or if, the, if, if there was a community that did not sin, then Allah would, re would replace that community with a community that did sin, and then beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Allah, is, Allah is, is one who loves forgiveness. We're approaching the month of Ramadan, and in the month of, and in the month of Ramadan, one of the prayers, one of the dua, and the supplications of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allahumma, إِنَّكَ أَفُوًّا تُحِبُّ الْعَفُ That, oh Allah, forgive me because you love to forgive. Pardon me. Forgive me of my sins because it is your nature, Ya Allah, Ya Rabb, to forgive us. It is in your nature to be merciful, to be afu, to love to forgive, to love to pardon. That is who Allah is. And so, yes, we are imperfect beings. And so we are going to have the frailties, the limitations that come and that are part and parcel of being human. And I say that because all too often, in my experiences in dealing with Muslims and interacting with our community, is that oftentimes people struggle with this basic idea that they are valuable, that they are imperfect. And I don't just mean imperfect with regards to their relationship with Allah, but I mean imperfection in general. Our relationships are never going to be perfect. We're never going to have the perfect marriage. We're never, my wife can certainly attest to that. We're never going to have the perfect relationships with one another. We are never going to create a perfect social order and community, but it is a part of that process. And all we are tasked to do, all that I am tasked to do as a husband, is to be the best husband that I can be for my wife. The best father that I can be for my children. The best brother that I can be for my human being. Because that is what being human means. Being human means to falter. Being human means to be, to be frail, to be limited, to have those blemishes. 
but not to dwell on them, not to live in them, not to allow those things, those mistakes to define us, but rather to transcend beyond those mistakes and to seek Allah's forgiveness, to seek Allah's guidance, to being the best that we can be. Or to put it differently, we are not being tasked with the impossible task of transcending our humanity, of being more than human. If God wanted that, He would have made us angels. If God wanted that, no panafil awli malaika the yamshuna mutmainin. That if God wanted that, He would have populated the earth with beings that were angelic and incapable of sin, incapable of human error. They would be perfect beings that would walk the earth in peace and tranquility. But that's not what God intended. That isn't what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for His creation here on this earth. He tasked us with the possibility of who we are. And that human beings are that potentiality, right? That we are created, fi ahsani taqweem. We are created, yes, in the best of modes. But what? Thumma radadnahu asfara safiri. But we are also capable of debasing ourselves to the lowest of low. And so what human beings are and remain and will always be is that potentiality of who we are and what we are created with, that God-given nature, that fitrah, and then the other end of that, which is to fall so far short of our humanity and of accepting our humanity. And so if I could conclude, one of the other challenges of understanding and appreciating the fact that we are human, as I said, the greatest challenge, being human, is to, yes, accept our humanity for what it is, which is that we are these imperfect beings. But also, to understand the fact, or actually, before I get into the final point, I want to go back to this idea of, 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 of being created of, of, of clay. Because I was talking about potentiality. Because one of the, one of the interesting, interesting and salient features of clay, just imagine clay, is that it is malleable, it is changeable, it is mutable. It can be spread, it can be, you know, compacted, it can expand, it can contract, right? Clay has that ability, right? Uh, the, the, the hallmark, the, one of the satanic, uh, 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 you know, uh, one of the things of satanic nature is to be arrogant and prideful of the fact that he was created خَلَقْتَنِي مِنَ النَّارِ that I have been created of, of fire. And he, he, meaning Adam, Adam والسلام, was created out of clay as sort of a, as sort of a defamatory thing, as something that was a weakness. But rather, I would submit to you that clay, unlike fire even, that clay has that potentiality, has that ability to be malleable, to change. And so if you find yourself, if we find ourselves in situations that we aren't happy with, that we aren't pleased with, if we find ourselves in states with regards to our relationship with our Creator, or our relationship with our wives and our husbands, or our relationship with our community members, if we find that we are not where we want to be, guess what? You have the capacity to change. You have the ability to change. Because that is in your nature. That is in our nature. Because we are created out of clay. And one of the beautiful features of clay is that it can be malleable, it can be molded, it can be changed. It's not cemented. It is not cemented. And that is how we are, as human beings are. But if I go back to the final point then that I was going to make is that an understanding, a part of understanding that we are human is to understand that we are a composite of a mind, body, and soul. Of a mind, body, and soul. We are not beings that are purely physical. We're not animals, we're not beasts, right? Although, unfortunately, we can sometimes act like that when we give in to our bestial nature, when we can give in to our lower selves, our, uh, our, our, our lower drives. But the fact of the matter remains is that we are a beautiful composite of a mind, body, and soul. And so we have, yes, we are physical beings, and our bodies have rights upon us. 
right? As the Prophet ﷺ reminded us, that our bodies have rights upon us. So we should take care of this vessel that Allah has given us with, that has gifted us with, that has trusted us with. Take care of ourselves, take care of our helps. And that's another, that's a khutbah in and of itself, right? Is the need for us to be physically taking care of ourselves. As a community, we suffer from uh, preventable diseases in the droves. It's at alarming rates, at epidemic rates, in terms of heart disease and diabetes and so on. And oftentimes these are things that are related and are preventable because they're related to exercise, lifestyle choices, and, and what we eat, our diet. And so again, we have the ability to change them. We have the ability to change those cholesterol numbers. Right? We have an ability to change the fact that we are borderline type 2 diabetic. Give up the gulab jamun every now and then. Right? So, so we have the ability to change. Again, going back to my earlier point. Well, yes, we are physical beings and we have physical limitations and our bodies have rights upon us and we have to fulfill those, those rights. That's why we marry. That's why yeah, Islam doesn't reject this sexual impulse, but rather it, 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 it legislates it. It says, yes, sexuality is a part of human nature, right? But we're going to regulate it. We're going to legislate it. It only occurs within the confines of marriage and so on. So yes, we have physical needs. We have to feed ourselves. If the time for prayer has come and you're hungry, eat first so you're not thinking of your appetite the whole time you're praying. Or if you have to relieve the call of nature, you're to do that first before you pray. Because our bodies have rights upon us. Right? Our bodies have rights upon us. The Prophet ﷺ overheard a group of companions saying that they would never marry and they would live lives of celibacy. Or that they would fast in perpetuity every day. And the Prophet said, no. No, that follow my sunnah, I marry, and I eat. And the best of fasting is the fast of the Prophet Dawood which was to fast on alternate days, if you're going to go about that strict sort of exercise and regimen. But nonetheless, so our bodies, yes, so we are physical beings, but we are also spiritual and intellectual beings. And one of the beauties of the Qur'an is the way in which it engages us in our totality. It engages us in our total composition. Because the Qur'an is the recital. It is an act of, rec of recitation. We are to moisten our tongues with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His Qur'an, his book, his kalam. And so the Qur'an is to be recited, to be read. That is to say that it has, even in engaging the scripture, we have a physical, we have a physical portion of that. Right? We have, we, there's a physical uh, engagement. But, there, but the Qur'an engages us as intellectual beings and spiritual beings. It, it, it asks us to ponder. The, uh, it asks us to use the aql, the intellect. And the aql can be a guiding force with regards to those parts of our humanity that we struggle with. Is our intellects. Our intellects keep us in check. And so yes, we are human beings who are a composition of a mind, body, and soul. And recognizing that. And recognizing that we have a responsibility to all of those elements. And the elements of Islam, Ihsan, excuse me, Iman, Islam, and Ihsan are that they beautifully engage all aspects of that composition of human beings. It engages us spiritually, yes, but it also engages us intellectually. It also engages us physically, because our actions, our ibadat, what we do, have physical manifestations. They have physical postures and what we perform, and prerequisites that involve cleansing the parts of the body and so on. And so the ibadah, our beautiful exploration of this idea that human beings are this composite. And so I say that, brothers and sisters, in order for us to reflect upon the task that lies before us, not only in accepting our humanity, accepting our fitrah, in preserving our fitrah, but also in recognizing that we as human beings are created in a certain way and in a certain fashion. And to understand that is the recipe for success. To understand that would lead us to not only on an individual level, because that's the task before us in conclusion, is that we must create a communal order. So not only as individuals and our own individual struggles, 
But as a community, we must, we are tasked as a community to create a social order, a community that allows those human beings to reach and to arrive at their potentiality. And so the task that we have, brothers and sisters, in this masjid, in this community, is to make room and to be accommodating for all members of our community, regardless of where they are, with regards to their level of practice and their relationship with the faith. If we're just preaching to the quote-unquote most righteous, as they say, we're just preaching to the choir man. What about reaching those who are just nominally Muslim or just identify themselves as Muslims alone in culture or culturally? Do we, in, do we have a space in our communities? Have we created a social order, again, that allows those human beings to feel that they are welcomed in our midst and that they will be allowed to grow and that they will be allowed to be nurtured and that they will be allowed to reach that full potentiality that God has created them with. And so the task that we have is to not only in ourselves, right, to preserve our fitrah, but to create a social order and a communal order that allows other human beings to preserve and to keep intact their fitrah, to remove those impediments, those obstacles, those fitan, those trials and tribulations, those traps that people fall into that can corrupt the human nature. And so the task that we have, brothers and sisters, is to not only preserve our own fitrah and to be conscious of those things that can corrupt our own natures, but to create a community, that to create a community that can allow others to grow into their full potential and to remove those obstacles that corrupt the human fitrah. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses this community, allows us to be that beacon of light and hope, and to allow us to be and create spaces where all are welcomed, and all are welcomed in our midst to grow and to become a part of this beautiful community. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصلى الله على سيدنا حبيبنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن الكريم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتنا إلا وأنت مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطيع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما وبعد إن الله وملائكته يصلون يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا لا تواخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا تواخذ لنا بمعرف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك 